Uh, okay. uh, we saw last time that the problem of random walks, random flights uh, led very naturally to a Gaussian distribution for the end to end distance, the displacement. And this looked like it was part of a very general result. Namely, you added up a whole lot of identically distributed random variables and you got a Gaussian in a certain limit. Uh, this is not uh, an accident, it is actually part of the central limit theorem which as I stated last time essentially says that if you have uh, an identically distributed random variables, then uh, the, a linear combination of these random variables suitably rescaled and shifted will in the limit as n goes to infinity end up with a Gaussian distribution provided each of the uh, random variables has a finite variance. This was uh, some and substance of the central limit theorem. Now, this is part of a more general uh, class of distributions called stable distributions and I would like to talk about stable distributions to start with. Uh, And I will try to explain at least qualitatively what uh, the stability refers to, what exactly it, it implies. Okay. So, we start by asking, uh, suppose I have a set of identically distributed independent random variables and let us call these random variables x1, x2 to xn and let us suppose these are iid or independent random variables. And let us suppose that the cumulative distribution function of this set of each of these variables is some f of x. Okay. So, the distribution function C d f equal to some f of x. What this implies is that the probability that any given random variable uh, x i less than equal to x, this uh, thing equal to f of x. And then we ask the following question, okay. is there any special form or forms of uh, f of x, this distribution function such that if I add up a whole lot of these random variables, iid rbs and rescale them in some suitable fashion, the distribution function for the sum, the resultant remains f of x, does not change at all. If you can do that for every n greater than or equal to 2, then this f of x is said to be a stable distribution. Okay. So, now let us formalize this definition and write it in uh, formal terms. There are several equivalent ways of defining a stable distribution, but I am going to quote a couple of them and not try to prove the equivalence of these definitions, but it will become intuitively clear what we mean as we see the explicit forms possible for this f of x. Okay. Just to recall to you what this f of x is for a Gaussian distribution for instance, um, for a Gaussian for a Gaussian, uh, this f of x recall is integral from minus infinity up to x dx prime e to the minus x minus x prime minus mu square over 2 sigma squared over root 2 pi sigma squared. And that as we know is an error function, this thing here. So, it is minus infinity to x, I can write it as minus infinity to 0 and then 0 to x. So, this uh, quantity will turn out to become uh, equal to 0 to uh, mi minus infinity to 0 is half the Gaussian after you shift to the origin here to x prime minus mu, you set that equal to some other variable. So, this is a half and then there is a 1 plus an error function of we shifted the variable and therefore, it is a function of x minus mu, x minus mu divided by we scaled it with root 2 sigma squared. So, this is what uh, the cumulative distribution function for a Gaussian looks like and so on. So, for each of these cases you can write down a cumulative distribution function and non decreasing function of x and then we ask under what conditions is this f of x stable. So, here is definition 1, 
Uh, one way to do this is to say uh, that if for every n greater than equal to 2, there exists a constant a n which is positive and b n which is just real such that this combination summation x sub i i equal to 1 to n that is the sum of these identically distributed random variables shifted by some constant uh, some amount which is n dependent and then rescaled with a 1 over a. That is a random variable too. If this random variable can be shown to have the same cumulative distribution function as each of the components x sub i, then I say that f is a stable distribution. So that is a precise definition. You are still left with the task of finding out if this is going to work or not for a given f of x. You have to find out if you can find a suitable constant a sub n and b n for each n greater than or equal to 2 and if that is possible then it is a stable distribution. Okay. We will see examples of space, we will write down all the stable distributions in some sense but we will see where this gets us. That is the first definition. It is in fact what I have said here in words. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, this is a very uh, strong criterion because yes. you could have n greater than or equal to m where m is some finite number. So yes. So we will talk about divisibility and so on. But this is the requirement that this is should be true for every n. Should be able to do this. Then and only then is it a stable distribution. So this is a necessary and sufficient condition that this be true. Hmm? But it's operationally not very useful. As you can see, although it is a formal definition, it is not telling us how to go about finding such a stable distribution. Okay. Here is a second definition which is equivalent to the first. So if x1 and x2, just two of them are independent identically distributed random variables with CDF f of x and if the following random variables if for given any given positive a1, a2 greater than 0, the random variable a1, x1, x1 plus a2, x2 minus some constant b divided by a constant a greater than 0. If in fact and if for a given this thing, uh, this random, uh, we can find A greater than 0 and B such that has a distribution F, then F is stable. So this says okay forget about adding n of these guys trying to find out something for all n and so on. Just take two of them and so on and if for any given positive constants a1 and a2 for every set of uh, given positive constants you can find the positive constant a and another constant b real constant such that this combination, this addition linear combination subtracted out suitably divided and rescaled by a if that is got uh, the same distribution function f of x then f of x is stable. This too is a necessary and sufficient condition okay and with a little work one can show that these are equivalent definitions here. But you see again 
neither of these things is saying anything about f itself. It is saying if you take this random variable or that random variable and test what its distribution function is and so on. We need a condition which says something about the distribution f itself and that is the third definition and that goes as follows. It says if for given positive a1 and a2 there exist a greater than 0 and b such that the convolution of f of x over a1 with x over a2 if the convolution of these two distribution functions is equal to f of x minus b over a, then f is stable. Okay. And now we are getting somewhere because this is now directly a condition on the distribution function itself. And what does it say? It says you scale one out, you scale the other out, and then you suitably and then you have a convolution and for any given positive a1, a2, if you can find a subtraction constant and a rescaling constant such that this is true, then f is a stable distribution. Okay. Now in every one of these definitions, if you leave out this shifting, if this is not there, if you do not need this, this constant or that constant, if this is 0 or the b is 0 here, then you say the distribution is strictly stable. Otherwise, you say this is a stable distribution. Okay. So, a strictly stable distribution is a special case of a more general definition of a stable distribution. Okay. Now, this definition immediately suggests to us the following. It says if these two things are in convolution, it means in some sense that the Fourier transforms would multiply. And it is immediately telling us that this Fourier transform has a certain factorization property and only then would this be possible at all. Which sort of tells you in some sense when will it have this factorization property. If you go back to definition 1, you need to add n of these fellows. So we need a, a characteristic function which is a Fourier transform of uh, probability uh, density function which should in some sense factorize which means it must be exponential in some form because what you want is the expectation value of e to the i k x that is the characteristic function and if x is the sum of terms these exponents would multiply each other if they are independently distributed. Right? We saw that already working for the random walk because recall that in the random walk problem although I did not write that out explicitly this is really what it meant. There we started with a vector r which was a sum of r 1 plus dot 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 up to r n in this fashion and then I said the characteristic function of this random variable here was e to the i k dot r whatever it is. So this is the expectation value of e to the i k dot summation 1 to n r i and the next step was to write this out as an exponent here of course it is a product as soon as you write it out. So this is equal to k dot r1 e to the i k dot r2 all the way up to e to the i k dot rn and then came the crucial observation, the crucial observation that these are all independent steps and therefore the, the expectation value of a product is a product of expectation values. So it immediately became e to the i k dot r 1 any one of these guys to the power n. And this was the one step, this was just the Fourier transform of the one step uh, random walk which was uh, p 1 of uh, r uh, p 1 tilde of k in this case and then it became raised to the power n. And if you recall this was sin kl over kl to the power n and then there was uh, all these integration variables etc. So this suggests to us that that is probably happening in general 
for a stable distribution. And indeed, it is so. It will turn out that uh, all the stable distributions can be classified completely and they are classified with the help of four parameters. The most general stable distribution is, is uh, labeled by four parameters. I am not going to write the general form down. Text on statistics will tell you what the most general form of the distribution of the cumulative distribution function is for a stable distribution. But what we need to understand is the following. It turns out that this coefficient a sub n that we are talking about in the summation in the first definition, this coefficient a sub n uh, in this definition here, this thing here must necessarily be of the form n to the power 1 over alpha, where alpha is a positive constant, okay, where 0 less than alpha less than equal to 2, it turns out, and I explain why it is restricted by this range, 0 to 2. Hmm? It turns out also that all the stable distributions are unimodal distributions, there is a single peak for every one of them and they are labeled primarily by this index alpha, the exponent or index alpha, okay. And it is unfortunately true that you cannot write down an explicit expression in general for the probability density function for a stable distribution. But because we see that the characteristic functions must in some sense be multiplicative, exponentials which get multiplied to each other. It turns out that the characteristic function p tilde of k must be of the form apart from phase factors, it must be of the form e to the minus some constant times k to the power alpha. So I am merely stating these results, I am not proving this, I am merely stating these results. And you can see that for a Gaussian, this was e to the minus k squared apart from a phase factor, you write that down explicitly but this it went like e to the minus k squared. For a Cauchy distribution it went like e to the minus mod k to the power 1 and so on. So they look, it looks like those guys are going to become stable distributions, okay. Now the restriction here is sort of uh, understood in the following way, at least uh, heuristically it will be the following. Suppose alpha were negative, then this is e to the minus 1 over mod k to some positive power and as mod k tends to infinity, that will tend to unity because it goes to e to the 0. So this means if alpha less than 0, p tilde of k will go to 1 as mod k tends to infinity, plus or minus infinity. Hmm? That cannot be integrated. So you cannot find a Fourier transform which will give you the probability density function, normalizable density function. So it is easy to understand why this restriction appears. Okay. That is immediate from this. On the other hand, if alpha is greater than 2, then it is a little more subtle to show why this cannot be a characteristic function because it turns out that the inverse Fourier transform cannot be shown to be non-negative. On the other hand, you know that the PDF P of x must be non-negative as a probability density function. So that is what puts the restriction on this side out here. So rules out, this rules out alpha less than 0, PDF must be non-negative. implies alpha less than equal to 2. Now that is harder to prove, I have not come anywhere near proving it, but this is a statement that you have to take as uh, uh, on faith that if alpha is greater than 2, you cannot establish the non-negativity of the Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform. So the stable distributions are characterized by this index here and the actual formal name for these stable distributions is uh, they are actually called Levy skew alpha stable okay. 
and for short I will just call it stable distributions. There is a little bit of confusion in terminology here uh, because uh, it turns out that there is one of the stable distributions is called the Levy distribution and it is not the general family that is being referred to here. So, we will just call these stable distributions, nothing more than that. Now, what are the other properties of these distributions? Well, the Gaussian is certainly a stable distribution as we will see and the most famous cases are the following, uh, three main cases, three important They are the ones that occur in practice very, very often, especially the Gaussian. The first of these is the Gaussian. One is the Gaussian. And this is alpha equal to 2. And we know what the density function looks like, p of x. This is equal to 1 over root 2 pi sigma squared e to the minus x minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared. And we know the characteristic function too, p tilde of k. Oh, incidentally, if the distribution has a density p of x, a PDF p of x, this is the Fourier transform. So, p tilde of 0 must be equal to 1 because that is the integral of p of x from minus infinity to infinity. So, this fellow here is e to the minus i mu k minus 1 half sigma square k square. Remember that the moment generating function um, was just a, uh, the cumulant generating function was just a quadratic of this kind. It was mu times u plus half sigma squared u squared and the characteristic function is the moment generating function at the value u, u equal to minus i k. So, it is this. P tilde of 0 is 0, is 1 uh, as you can see. So, it is normalized correctly and that is the, the Gaussian expression. What is the variance of the Gaussian? Sigma, Sigma squared is the variance, a finite variance. Okay. The second case that is very important is the Cauchy distribution and in this case alpha equal to 1. Actually, the general Cauchy distribution need not be symmetric between uh, about the mean value it is in general skew, but we are looking at a special case where the certain other parameters other than alpha, the other three parameters have been set equal to special values. And the most common form of this is when p of x equal to some lambda over x minus mu whole squared plus lambda squared is lambda over pi, that is the normalization constant. This is x, curly x. What is p tilde of k in this case? It is got to be proportional to k e to the power minus mod k because remember I said that the Cauchy distribution corresponds to alpha equal to 1. So, for the Cauchy, the symmetric Cauchy distribution, this guy here, uh, p of k equal to e to the minus uh, i mu k minus lambda mod k. Okay. Again, p tilde of 0 is 1, it is normalized and it is got exponent alpha equal to 1. That is the reason for this. The mean value is mu and that is the peak of the distribution, it is unimodal, so is this unimodal peaked about mu. What is the variance of this distribution? What do you think the variance goes like? Well, you got to multiply this by x squared and integrate minus infinity to infinity and the denominator goes like x squared. So, it diverges, yes, the variance is infinite. For this, the variance is infinite. What is the mean value? Mu, but barely so because if you just did naive power counting, you put an x here and you integrate it, 
then the denominator goes like x squared. So, the whole integrand goes like 1 over x which will logarithmically diverge. Hmm? But because it is symmetric about that midpoint, if you shift to x minus mu, the answer turns out to be 0, the mean value. So, that gives you a finite mean mu, but it is barely so. Hmm? The variance is certainly infinite for this distribution. Okay? Notice that this distribution has a tail this guy has a tail that for large values of mod x it goes like 1 over x squared. Hmm? Unlike this which has an exponential e to the minus x squared that goes to 0 faster than any power any ne negative power of x plus minus infinity hmm? and this is going to be a general feature this is a general feature turns out that as soon as you have this property here. p of x will turn out to go asymptotically namely as mod x tends to plus uh, infinity it will go asymptotically like 1 over mod x to the power alpha plus 1 hmm, for alpha less than 2. And indeed when alpha is equal to 1 you see it goes like 1 over x squared out there hmm. and what does this imply? If alpha is less than 2 and the denominator goes like 1 over mod x to the power alpha plus 1, it implies infinite variance So, it says the entire family of stable distributions except for the Gaussian all of them have a huge amount of scatter the variance is formally infinite and the Gaussian is the only stable distribution with a finite variance. In fact, this also tells you that if alpha is less than 1 between 0 and 1 even the mean value is infinite even the first moment does not exist for those distributions, but certainly the variance is finite only for the Gaussian. This is a very crucial observation and all these fellows are called heavy tailed distributions. Essentially it says large values of this uh, of these random variables are possible and have a probability mass which is significant unlike the Gaussian where it just gets cut off faster than any inverse power of x. That is a crucial observation. The third of these, we will come back to this, the third of these uh, special cases is this, it is called the Levy distribution. And it corresponds to alpha equal to a half. And it looks like this the distribution p of x is characterized by a constant uh, c, uh, so 1 uh, c over 2 pi x cubed to the power a half e to the minus c over 2 x. But here 0 less than equal to x less than infinity. I have shifted the it is a semi infinite random variable in the semi infinite range for the random variable and I have shifted that uh, the beginning of that range to 0 with suitable rescaling uh, by a translation. So, there is a constant c positive and it is not hard to check that this is normalized to unity can this in here and you could ask what is the characteristic function here uh, turns out p tilde of k not surprisingly is e to the minus c modulus k to the power a half as promised is what it should be and it is multiplied by a phase factor in this case it is 1 plus i times the sin of k. And it is called the Levy distribution. Okay. What does it look like? What does the shape of this fellow look like? Well, for the Lorentzian and Gaussian we have seen what the shape looks like for this uh, thing here, here is x, here is p of x. As x tends to infinity, positive infinity, this factor tends to unity. This goes like 1 over x to the 3 halves. Hmm? 
in the denominator. That itself tells you that the variance has got to be infinite because the denominator goes like x to the 3 halves alpha plus 1. So, it is 1 over x to the 3 halves and what does it look like near the origin? What is it going to do near x equal to 0? 0. Is it 0 or infinite or finite? It is 0, it is dead 0 because this uh, factor in the denominator is swamped by the exponential factor e to the minus 1 over something which goes to 0 is going to go very rapidly to 0. So, this function not only is it 0 at the origin, but all its derivatives are also 0 at the origin, all its derivatives of finite order. So, it looks like this, this is a 1 over x to the 3 halves dk. and the peak is characterized by the scale c. Okay. Now, we could ask where do these distributions appear, where do they occur, but it turns out there is a very close connection between different stable distributions in a very specific sense. Oh, by the way, let me before I go on mention that although I have written down explicit forms for the probability density function for these three special cases. This is not in general possible for generic alpha between 0 and 2. In fact, it turns out that you cannot write this p of x in terms of elementary functions other than these cases, these three cases. You can write p of x in terms of hypergeometric functions for rational values of alpha and so on like uh, 3 halves etcetera, but in general all you can do is to write down specific forms for the characteristic function for its Fourier transform, but already that gives us all the information we need about these distributions. Uh, here are examples, some physical examples of when this is going to happen, when these distributions are going to appear. Well, the Gaussian of course, we see it appears everywhere. So, let us go back to our same expression of uh, random flights or diffusion or something like that. When you have a particle diffusing on a line and we will do this in some detail later on along the x axis, if you have a particle freely diffusing on the x axis, then uh, its probability density function if it starts from the origin at t equal to 0 is of the form e to the minus x squared over 4 dt, where d is called the diffusion constant divided by square root 4 pi dt. That is a, a, a Gaussian with the 2 sigma squared e equal to 4 dt or sigma squared the variance is 2 dt. So, it says the variance of this particle uh, increases as time goes linearly with time. So, that is a Gaussian distribution, but now if you ask what is the distribution of 1 over x squared that turns out to be a Levy distribution because it is not hard to see that if you have uh, p of x let us write a normal Gaussian down equal to 1 over root 2 pi sigma squared e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared say a Gaussian centered at the origin and ask what is the probability density function of the random variable xi which is 1 over x squared. Okay. That has a Levy distribution. Okay. In fact, uh, the density function for rho of xi this will imply is 1 over root 2 pi sigma squared xi cubed e to the minus uh, 1 over 2 sigma squared xi. So, the constant c is 1 over 2 sigma squared square root 1, one over 2 sigma squared c over 2 whatever it is. Right. So, so, this is precisely a Levy uh, distribution with exponent half here. But that is if I took this random variable and I gave the example of the Maxwell distribution of velocities where I said uh, the energy has a very strange distribution 1 over square root of epsilon e to the minus epsilon exponential that was not a Levy distribution, but here we are asking for the distribution of 1 over x squared and then it has this guy here. Well, in connection with the diffusion problem itself there is another random variable which has precisely this kind of distribution. For instance, if you ask all right, I start with diffusing particle on the x axis, I start at 0 and I ask as it moves about what is the first 
what is the distribution of the time where it first hits the point x, some given point x. Uh, let us call this just to be uh, not to confuse it with that random variable x, let us call this a and ask here is this particle diffusing on the x axis starting at x equal to 0 at t equal to 0 and I ask what is the probability that between time t and t plus dt the particle crosses this point a for the first time because it is doing a zigzag motion for the first time and that is the distribution the random variable here is a time and if I call that q to cross the point a at time t having started at a uh, at 0 uh, and we want to I want to cross t at uh, the point a at time t having started at the point 0 this quantity here this is equal to turns out um, 1 over uh, turns out to be a over 4 pi d t cubed to the power 3 halves e to the minus a squared over 4 d t. And that is a distribution in time, so t uh, greater than or equal to 0 and integral q of t a 0 d t 0 to infinity equal to 1. That we know because this is a Levy distribution which is normalized to unity already. It is called the first passage time distribution okay? and it is precisely a Levy distribution. So that is the simplest physical example I know of where a Levy distribution appears. Yeah. To the power. Ah, sorry. This is a power half. I already put a t cubed in here, so quite right. It is a half. Yes. So it is t to the 3 halves in the denominator here. In general, there is a connection between a random variable which has a stable distribution with index alpha where alpha is between 1 and 2 and a random variable which is a function of this original random variable has a dis stable distribution with index 1 over alpha. So if for instance, uh, if x has a stable distribution with index with exponent alpha where 1 is less than equal to alpha less than equal to 2 then 1 over x to the alpha has a stable distribution And remember that this 1 over alpha therefore is half less than equal to 1. Uh, half less than equal to 1. So the new exponent is between half and that is what we use there when I said that a Gaussian which has exponent alpha a 2 equal to 2. 1 over the Gaussian square, 1 over x to the alpha has a Levy distribution with exponent half, precisely the point. Okay. Similarly, you could ask uh, does the Cauchy distribution appear in a natural way in the diffusion problem. Uh, notice that uh, everything with alpha less than 2 has no variance, they are all heavy tailed, no variance at all. What about uh, diffusion problem in which the Cauchy distribution appears naturally? There are lots of places where the Cauchy distribution, what is called a Lorentzian in physics, appears naturally, but here is a very simple instance. Uh, again, let us go back to the diffusion problem and look, which is a physical problem, and look at a very simple 
function of a random variable. So, suppose you have two particles both of which start at the origin and diffuse on the x axis such that the coordinate of one at any instant of time is x 1 and the other one is x 2 okay. And you look for the random variable xi equal to x 1 over x 2 and ask what its distribution is okay. where each of these has a probability density function given by the solution of the diffusion equation right. So, it says rho of xi therefore as a function of time this is equal to an integral minus infinity to infinity dx1 minus infinity to infinity dx2 and let us suppose for simplicity they have the same diffusion coefficient that need not be the case but then there is a 1 over 4 pi dt and then e to the minus x 1 squared minus x 2 squared over 4 dt and then a delta function of xi minus x 1 over x 2 that is the normalized density function for this rho of xi. Now, what is the physical range of xi? Each of x 1 and x 2 runs from 0 to infin minus infinity to infinity. So, what is the range of xi? Again minus infinity to infinity right. So, we, in that sense we are spared putting extra conditions and all we have to do is to do this integral out here. Now, the obvious way to do this is to write this as x 2 times xi and get rid of the x 1 integral right. So, let me write this as a delta function of x 1 minus x 2 xi okay. and I have to remove this factor 1 over x 2 from there and take its modulus. So, this becomes mod x 2 times this okay. and then all I have to do is to replace x 1 by x 2 times xi. So, this becomes e to the minus x 2 squared into 1 plus xi squared over 4 dt and all this goes away the x 1 integration goes away and I have this out here. So, this is straightforward to do uh, all I have to do is to write this as twice 0 to infinity and get rid of the modulus it is an even function now. But 2 x 2 d x 2 is d of x 2 squared. So, I can change variables to x 2 squared then this goes this goes and this becomes some d u over 4 pi d t uh, e to the minus u times this fellow here. So, that is a trivial integral. and d u times a e to the minus a u is just 1 over a when f a is positive right. So, that will kill this 4 d t and give you 1 over pi into 1 plus xi square. And that is a Cauchy distribution in xi okay. about mean value nu equal to 0 with this lambda parameter set equal to 1 in this case. What is interesting about this? I said this is the distribution at time t. So, what really happened here to t? It disappeared, it completely disappeared. So, this is true at all times. It is really true at any instant of time. So, the ratio of uh, the coordinates for a diffusing for two diffusing particles the ratio of their coordinates is actually independent it has a distribution independent of time and it is a Cauchy distribution okay. What would have happened if I had a d 1 and a d 2 of these guys. So, I leave that to you as an exercise if the first particle has a diffusion coefficient d 1 and the second one has a d 2 then show that the result is still a Cauchy distribution except this parameter here I mean there would be a d 1 over d 2 sitting here 
there will be a lambda parameter which is equal to 1 in this special case. Okay. So, this is one more place where uh, the Cauchy distribution appears naturally. Okay. There are lots and lots of such examples. Now, we will say a little more about this Levy distribution and these long tail distributions a little later when we do anomalous diffusion, when we talk about uh, anomalous transport. Okay. But the take home lesson is that you have this family of very special distributions called stable distributions and they are characterized primarily by this exponent alpha. Alpha runs from this positive runs up to 2. 2 is the extreme case of the Gaussian which is a very respectable distribution. It has got uh, moments of all orders including a finite variance and all the others are heavy tailed and they do not have variances. Okay. On the other hand you could ask is there a central limit theorem for them because we already said there is a central limit theorem for the Gaussian. So, is there a generalized central limit theorem for all the stable distributions? The answer is yes. So, if you started with identical variably distributed variables and you said that they did not have variances, but for instance if you if you have a p of x going like 1 over x to the power alpha plus 1 and you ask the variance does not exist because alpha is less than 2. On the other hand does some what is the maximum moment that exists for this distribution. So, you could ask a thing like what does uh, what kind of uh, dx if I say x to some beta divided by x to the power alpha plus 1 at infinity when would this exist and I put a p of x, p of x has a tail which goes like this. So, if I put beta equal to 2 I am in trouble if alpha is less than 2, but what is the maximum value of beta that you can have for which this converges. So, it is clear that this denominator must go to 0 the whole thing must go to 0 faster than 1 over x. So, you must have uh, alpha plus 1 minus beta to be greater than 1 right or beta must be less than alpha. So, if this alpha for example is 3 halves then although the second moment of this distribution does not exist the beta th moment would exist even if beta is a fraction as long as beta is less than 3 halves okay. And as alpha gets closer and closer to 2 you get the variance would be in uh, would diverge formally, but beta would exist where beta gets closer and closer to 2 okay. So, such moments would certainly exist. Huh? Then this generalized central moment uh, central uh, limit theorem says that if you have a whole lot of iid uh, random variables such that the beta th moment exists where beta is just less than alpha out here then the sum of those fellows in a suitable limit as n tends to infinity would tend to one of these stable the appropriate stable distribution in this case so this is a generalization of the central limit theorem which simply says that each of these stable distributions is the attractor for a whole family of distributions all of which have a certain moments up to a certain order and then the maximal one among those moments will decide the alpha value for the stable distribution to which these distributions get attend uh, in the limit okay. So, this is what the appropriate generalization is and there are further generalizations of this. I will mention this a little bit more when we do fractional Brownian motion when we talk about Brownian motion which is not the usual kind. Okay. So, so much for uh, stable distributions they have a lot of other interesting properties we can discuss subsequently, but now I would like to ask uh, a reverse question a different kind of question I would like to ask the following uh, given not a set of iid rvs, but given a random variable x with certain properties specified distribution function and so on and so forth. When can I write this random variable as a sum of two identically distributed random variables? 
if I can write it as a sum of two random variables which are i d r v s then I would say this variable is two divisible. If I can write it as a sum of three i i d r v s I would say it is three divisible and so on hmm? and in general n of them n divisible. Then I can ask are there random variables for which I can write the random variable as a sum of n i i d r v s for all n greater than or equal to two hmm? no matter how large. If I can then I say this, this random variable is infinitely divisible. So, I would like to introduce the concept of infinite divisible random variables. So, this is uh, when x can be written So, when this can be done then I say x is an infinitely divisible random variable okay. for every n I will call the x sub i is the components of x because you add them all up you get x and it is a very special property you can see immediately it is not going to happen most of the time but when it does you have an infinitely divisible random variable and what makes things interesting is that the distribution of every one of these x's need not be the final distribution of x itself okay. need not be so at all you just want them to be identically distributed random variables which is a common distribution function which could be different in functional form than the distribution of the sum itself. Right. So, it is clear that stable distributions are infinitely divisible immediately. Not only that, in the case of stable distributions, the distribution of each of the x i's for every n is exactly the same as the distribution of x itself. And that is a very special property, right. So, it is immediately clear that stable distributions. are infinitely divisible. Is the converse true? No reason why that should be true at all, no reason at all. So, the converse is not true, we are going to give counter examples. So, converse not necessarily true. This idea of divisibility is a little subtle, you have to be a little cautious here. You may have a random variable, let me give you an example. Suppose you have a random variable which takes the value 0 or 1, it is a Bernoulli trial let us say. So, this variable can take x 1, can take values in the set 0 1 and x 2 also takes values in the set 0 1, x 3 0 1. Now, what is the sample space of the random variable x equal to x 1 plus x 2 plus x 3? 0 to 3, 0 1 2 3. So, this has sample space 0 1 2 3. And clearly, just by inspection, if you can see if these appear with equal probabilities this is just heads or tails and you are asking what happens to the sum of the scores right. Then it is clear that this is 3 divisible. This random variable has some distribution in this case it will be a binomial distribution and it is 3 divisible in this fashion. Is it 2 divisible? Is it possible to have a random variable which takes values in the set 0, 1, 2, 3 and ask can it be written as the sum of 2 IIDRVs? 
Is this possible? Well, suppose you say 0 and 1, it is clear it will not reach 3, that is gone. Then you say 0, 1 and 2, let us suppose each of the components has value 0, 1, 2, then 4 is in the sample space of the sum which is not given, okay. Then you say let it, suppose it is 0 and 3 halves, so it reaches this. But since 0 is in the sample space, 3 halves has to be in the sample space which it is not. So there is no way in which you can make this 2 divisible, right. So here is a random variable, this fellow here, which is 3 divisible but not 2 divisible. So this divisibility is not such a trivial concept, it requires a little bit of uh, understanding. So not everything is divisible, but now we are saying something much stronger, you are saying for every n this variable is divisible, n divisible. Hmm? So it puts a lot of constraints on this, on the possible distributions that can have this property. Hmm? What do you think is the primary property that it has? Because this has to become IID RVs, it implies that the characteristic function must be a product of characteristic functions because these are IID RVs, right? So it immediately implies that X must have a characteristic function P tilde of K which must be of the form the nth power of some other characteristic function. So this must be of the form P tilde let me put an n here to show these are different functions for different n's in general and it must be of this form, okay. Only then is this variable going to be infinitely divisible, is this random variable going to be infinitely divisible, okay. So now the matter is simple. All we got to do is to look for all those characteristic functions which has this property here. So as soon as you can write this, the matter is over. Let us look at that example again. Let us look at that guy here and see what, what this implies for divisibility. What? Pardon me? Is the decomposition unique? So if you... Yeah, we have not answered questions like is it always going to be unique for a given n and so on and so forth. Not, no a priori reason why this should be so and so on. But tell me, if I take an arbitrary characteristic function p tilde of k in this fashion and ask can I not always write it as something to the power, I do a 1 over n here and a raise a power n, is it not always going to be the case? Suppose that were true, it would imply that this is an honest characteristic function. So it means p tilde of 0 is 1 and its inverse Fourier transform is non-negative. Huh? But now you are asking, if I raise this to the power 1 over n and I get some function here, phi n of k, you are saying this too should be a characteristic function. It too must have an inverse Fourier transform which is non-negative and that is not true in general. So this means that divisibility is not a trivial concept at all, hmm? not necessary that this is going to happen all the time, it happens only in special cases. Now let us look at the Bernoulli trials that we talked about. Now if you had n Bernoulli trials, then the distribution that we got for the resultant was in fact a binomial distribution if you recall, right. So in that case you got the binomial distribution was of the form some n n p to the power n 1 minus p to the power n minus n in this fashion and what was the generating function for this guy? What was the f of z in this case? It was a very straightforward thing. It was just so remember that f of z was equal to p z plus q to the power n, that is all it was, right. And then the characteristic function p tilde of k in this case was replace z by e to the minus i k and that was it. Or q plus p e to the minus i k, etc. right. Is that n divisible? 
you can see it is a product of functions all identical functions p plus uh, q plus p e to the minus i k raised to the power n. So, you would immediately say it is n divisible provided this fellow itself provided uh, q plus p e to the minus i k was the characteristic function of something or the other and it is it is the characteristic function of a Bernoulli trial a random variable which takes value p uh, 1 with probability p and 0 with probability q right. So, trivially the binomial distribution with parameter capital N is N divisible into N Bernoulli trials ok not binomial distribution binomial random variable at all, but n Bernoulli trials immediately follows ok right. What about the geometric distribution? What, what about the negative binomial distribution? What happened in the case of the negative binomial distribution? Recall that uh, the negative binomial distribution had a distribution which looked like n minus n plus 1 n p to the power n q to the power little n. Little n was a random variable which took all the non-negative integers in its sample space 0 to infinity and capital N was some given positive integer ok. This fellow here had a generating function f of z which was p divided by uh, 1 minus q z to the power n. That is why it was called a negative binomial distribution ok. Is that n divisible? It looks like the nth power of something capital n po power of something right. So, if p over 1 minus q z is a characteristic function of q. So, in this case p tilde of k equal to p over 1 minus q e to the minus i k to the power n. So, if this fellow is a characteristic function or if this fellow alone 1 p over 1 minus q z is the generating function for a probability distribution, then this negative binomial distribution with parameter capital N is capital N divisible into N of those distributions uh, N of those random variables right. Is that a generating function p over 1 minus q z? Yes, it is the generating function of a geometric distribution right which had a probability density uh, function probability distribution p times q to the power n right. So, immediately this is n divisible n divisible into n geometrically distributed random variables What about the Poisson distribution? Is that n divisible? Uh, Let us write the random, uh, let us write the distribution down for a Poisson. We had e to the minus mu, mu to the power n over n factorial was p of p n, and the characteristic function p tilde of uh, k was equal to e to the minus mu e to the minus uh, well e to the power mu e to the minus i k minus 1. It was e to the mu times z minus 1 for the generating function. So, I put z is e to the minus i k get the characteristic function ok. Can this be written as the nth power of something? Yes, trivially so. What sort of random variable has a characteristic function like that? A Poisson with mean value mu over n for every positive integer n, right. So, it is n divisible. Is it stable? Is this? It does not fall in the family of stable distributions. It is not. Uh, 
it's discrete in it's in the sample space is discrete and so on and so forth. So, it is the discrete analog of a stable distribution, but it is infinitely divisible. This guy is infinitely divisible. It even has this property that for every little n, it is n divisible into n Poisson random variables uh, with appropriate means, etcetera. Is the Gaussian uh, distribution n divisible, uh, infinitely divisible? Yes, indeed. It is a stable distribution, so it is immediately so, and you see that at once because in that case the characteristic function p tilde of k was e to the minus i mu k minus one half sigma squared k squared and you can certainly write this as mu over n and sigma over square root of n squared and the whole thing raised to the power n. So, of course, it is it is n divisible with mean mu over n and with a standard deviation sigma over root n. It is a stable distribution, so it is automatically infinitely divisible as well. Okay. What about the skellum distribution? The difference of two Poisson random variables is that n divisible? Is it infinitely divisible? You would expect it to be so because in this case it is just the difference of two Poisson random variables, and if you recall, uh, this had e to the mu e to the minus i k minus 1 plus nu uh, times uh, e to the minus u, so it was e to the i k minus 1. That is what the characteristic function was for, uh, for the skellum distribution. Okay. And of course, now it is very trivial matter to say this is mu over n, mu over n and I raise this to the power n. So, yes, it is also infinitely divisible. Okay. So, the set of infinitely divisible distributions is a bigger set than the set of uh, stable distributions, but the stable distributions is a very special subset of it. In general, for infinitely divisible distributions, the components do not have the same distribution as the original distribution, but for the stable ones, they do, and for the Poisson, they do. So, it becomes an interesting question to classify all such distributions. This gets us into statistics. I am not going to go into that detail here, except to show you that by these simple examples, you can see the idea of the notion of divisibility and uh, what sort of role it plays. We will try to get back to this in uh, various other examples. So, let me stop here today.